Hello, I am Professor Sims, and this video is an introduction to compound light microscopy. This is the third in the series of 10 lab sessions held as part of my laboratory for the fundamentals of microbiology. Please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information if you are a student that's currently enrolled in this course. The learning objectives for this unit include learning to identify parts, function of each part of the compound light microscope, learning to properly operate and care for the compound light microscope, becoming competent in basic slide preparation skills, observing various specimens using low power, high power, and low immersion lenses, and as always, understanding the safety and disposal procedures related to these experiments. So compound light microscopes magnify images, if the ones in our lab anyway, magnify images up to a thousand times their actual size. Microscopes are needed to view microorganisms that are measured in micrometers. That is micrometers. So that's one times 10 to the negative six meters. It's very small. Viruses can be way smaller than that by um, three orders of magnitude. So they are measured in nanometers. So here you have a nice uh, figure that illustrates the limits of what you can see with the human eye, with the light microscope, and then with the electron microscope. The human eye can see up to about, well, down to about the thickness of a human hair. And then if you want to see things smaller than that, you will need to use a light microscope. A light microscope can see things as small as a single cell, um, even a single bacterial cell. If you want to look at a virus, or even nowadays, you can see things as small as a single atom, um, which is just amazing. But in order to do that, you need an electron microscope. And we don't have that in the teaching lab because they're extraordinarily expensive and very sensitive. So we're going to be using the light microscopes and looking at things in this range here. So that's going to be between negative 3, 10 to the negative 3, and 10 to the negative 7 meters, roughly. You will need to know the parts of the microscope, which are defined here. I'm going to let you read through those, but the main ones are going to be your stage, illuminator, <clears throat> condenser, iris, ocular lens, objective lens, your course adjustment, and fine adjustment knobs. In class, your instructor will demonstrate where all of these parts are, where they're located on the scope, and it's going to be the scopes that you're using throughout the semester. So be sure that you can identify all of these parts, make sure that you know how to properly use all of these parts, and we'll also discuss in class how to properly care for the microscopes. Um, we'll do all of that in great detail, and you will be using these scopes for the rest of the semester. For lab three, you're going to be preparing wet mount slides. In order to prepare a wet mount, first you obtain a glass slide. You want to make sure the slide is clear and clean, doesn't have any fingerprints on it. You can use lens paper if you need to to clean the slide if necessary. You want to place one small drop of your sample onto the slide, usually in the middle. You place a cover slip at an angle on top of the sample. You do it at an angle to try to prevent uh, bubbles getting trapped underneath the cover slip. In a good wet mount, the cover slip will not have bubbles trapped under it and it won't move when the slide is moved or even if you turn the slide upside down, the cover slip should stay in place. In a compound light microscope, light from the source, which in this case is going to be the illuminator, is focused on the specimen by the condenser lens. So this is the condenser lens. It then enters the objective lens, which is here. When it enters the object objective lens, it is magnified and it produces a real image. The real image is then magnified again by the ocular lens, which produces a virtual image that is seen by the eye. So during all of this refraction of light going on, the image does get flipped. It gets flipped vertically and it gets flipped horizontally. So we'll go through in lab how um, 
you can try to kind of get used to orientating yourself. We have some special slides that you can use to, to practice with. When you're focusing and observing a specimen, when you first turn the light on, you want to turn it on to half power because you start with the 10x objective and the 10x objective lets all the light through. So it's going to be very bright. If you don't, if you turn the illuminator on all the way, you're going to go blind. You start with the illuminator on at half power. You use the course adjustment knob to lower the stage. You set the scope to the 10x objective. You always start on 10x. That's the scanning objective. It's also the shortest one, so you have the least amount, uh, the, the smallest chance of actually scratching the slide or the objective. So you always start on the 10x. Then you put the slide on the stage and you have slide clips hold the slide in place. Then you use the course knob to raise the stage and decrease your working distance. So we'll go through this in lab, but you want to have as small a working distance as possible so that you don't have all of your light being lost to the air, being refracted away. You can adjust the interpupillary distance, which is the distance that your oculars are. You want to do that because you don't want to have a situation where you have double vision or you, maybe you can only see through one ocular. If you are having those kinds of issues, you're really going to struggle through this class. So adjust the interpupillary distance, work with you to make sure that you can figure out how to do that. While you're looking through the oculars, you should be able to move the course knob and you want to do this slowly because the course adjustment knob moves the stage up and down and it moves it in big increments. So do that kind of slowly. Once you can see the specimen at all, then you're going to use your fine adjustment knob to further focus the image. You can also use your iris diaphragm, open and close it to try to change the contrast. The iris diaphragm is going to be your best friend in this class, I promise. Once you have your specimen in view, in focus, then you want to center it and then rotate the nose piece to where the 40x objective is in place. And you should be able to just use fine focus to further focus your specimen. So you're trying to do as little bit of movement as little change as possible between the 10 and the 40x. This is a skill that you're going to have to learn. It's, it's going to take some practice. If you're having trouble, just know this, we're going to do a lot of microscope work in labs three, four, and five. It's three labs in a row where we're going to heavily use the microscope, so you're going to get lots of practice. And if you need more practice, you can come to office hours you can uh, email me to set up an appointment. You can come to the contingency lab. Okay, so if you need more practice, 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 just let, let your instructor or let me know. Okay, so the whole idea of your microscopic field and par focal distance, this one is a little bit tough sometimes to wrap your head around, but it's very important. If you understand how these things work, it's going to help you learn how to use the microscope a lot faster, a lot more efficiently. The idea is that when you increase magnification, the specimen that you're looking at, it's going to look very different. And the reason for that is not only because it's getting bigger, like yes, it's getting bigger, but it's also and mainly because that you're actually looking at a much smaller portion of the specimen. In this figure here, I have a simplified version and a more complicated version of the same thing. So if you have a little heart and you have it focused in the 10x objective and it's centered and it's beautiful and it's perfect and then you move up to the 40x objective, that heart is going to get a lot bigger, which you would expect. Um, and then once you go up to the 100x objective, if that is focused, it's so big now that you can't really even tell that it's a heart. And that's because you're actually zooming into this, this little bit in the center. Okay, so what you're seeing in the 100x objective is actually this little tiny piece right here. If you understand how that works, then you will understand the fact that if you are not going up in your objective magnification with the thing that you're trying to zoom in on perfectly centered, then you're going to lose it. Because not only is the little heart here being magnified, but so is all of the empty space around it. 
that is all being magnified as well. If you don't have the thing that you're trying to look for, so if I don't have this heart perfectly centered before I move the objective up to 40, then most likely what I will see in 40 is not going to be the heart, it's going to be this empty white space. So they are par focal scopes, which means that you should have as little bit, a uh, small amount of movement of the specimen and movement of the uh, stage as possible between the objectives. Just little tiny tweaks with the fine adjustment, maybe turning the light up, maybe opening, closing the iris diaphragm, diaphragm um, little adjustments between objectives. If you do too big of an adjustment between your objectives, you are going to lose your specimen. And then what you'll have to do is go back down to 10 and start over again. So this is a skill. It takes practice. And some people do get really frustrated during lab three. I want you all to understand and know you don't learn how to use a microscope perfectly the first time. Okay, it does take practice. Total magnification is the measurement of the power of the ocular and the objective lens, which work in conjunction. So we already talked about how the light gets magnified by the objective first, and then again by the ocular. So total magnification has to take both of those into account. In this lab, um, all of our microscopes, the ocular lens has a magnification of 10 times. If you're using a 10x objective, the actual total magnification is 100 times actual size. If you're looking through the 40x objective, then the total magnification is 400x. And <clears throat> finally, if you're looking through the 100x objective, the total magnification is 1,000 times. Now, it's also really important to understand that magnification and resolution are two totally different things. Magnification only takes an object and makes it look bigger. So if that object is not in focus, when you go up in your objectives, it's still going to be out of focus. Magnification just enlarges your image. Resolution is the thing that makes it to where you can clearly see it. So the definition is the ability to distinguish between two points a specified distance apart, points far enough apart for light to pass between them. So we were talking about if something is in focus. We're actually talking about if it is resolved, if it has good resolution. Resolution is determined by the numerical aperture of the objective lens. The numerical aperture is a measure of the cone of light that can be gathered by the objective lens. We're going to talk about the 100x objective in just a minute, but using immersion oil can actually change the numerical aperture and decrease the light that's diffracted and therefore increases the light that is gathered by the objective. So the numerical aperture depends on the size of the cone of light the lens can receive and the medium that the light is passing through. When you're using the 100x objective, and only when you're using the 100x objective, you're going to be using immersion oil. And this is because you have the refractive index of glass, the refractive index of air. These two things that is, are quite different. So what happens is in the 100x objective, it's dark and you have to take an extra measure to get more light to come into the objective. And if you use the immersion oil, it has the same refractive index as the glass on the slide and the glass on the objective lens. So it allows the light to kind of get caught into this little tunnel or a little light bridge between the slide and the lens. And, and, and it doesn't get lost. It doesn't get diffracted. To be clear, the presence of the oil between the objective lens and the specimen on the slide, it decreases the diffraction of light as it passes through the objective. And then this is important for resolution of objects at 1,000 times their actual size. Some special precautions and some directions for using the 100x objective. To use the 100x objective, also called the oil immersion objective, Place a drop of immersion oil on the slide in the viewing area. This is after you've got it in focus on 10x and then after you have focused it on 40x. You never start at 100. You never start at 40. You always have to start at 10x, then move up to 40x, then move up to 100x. Then you place a drop of immersion oil on the slide, 
turn the revolving nose piece to engage the oil immersion objective. Use the fine adjustment control to focus the image and the oil on the specimen must be free of bubbles or your image is going to be impaired. Um, if you do have bubbles, to remove the bubbles, you can slightly move the oil immersion lens back and forth over the specimen. It is very important that all of the oil be cleaned off the lens before storing the scope. Never use immersion oil with the 10x or 40x lenses, and it, may, it usually is necessary to increase the amount of light. So you can turn the light up at the illuminator or the condenser. And again, this is a skill that you're going to master with practice. So we demonstrate this in the lab, and you'll have some time to practice during lab three, and then, of course, again, during four and five. So for the lab three procedure, there's only one procedure. And what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that you can identify the parts of the light microscope, that you know how each one of them functions. You're going to learn how to use the microscope how to take care of it, what to do when you put it up. So you know, you've got to clean the lenses, wrap the cord, drop the stage, leave it on 10x. We'll go through all of this when we're together in class. You are going to prepare wet mount slides for the pond water specimen and for the, um, the yeast cells. Then you're going to focus and observe under all three of the magnifications. First, the human hair. You want to do the human hair first because it's the largest. Then the pond water. The pond water is kind of a grab bag. You could have any number of things in there. I'll show you in a minute some of the most common things that we find. But, but pond water is much smaller than human hair, but we are looking at multicellular eukaryotic organisms. Um, and they're alive, so they, they're swimming around and stuff. So it's really fun. And then the last thing that you want to do, because it's the hardest thing, is going to be the, the yeast. Because they are very small, single-cell organisms. Make sure you go through your safety guidelines, as usual. Some, some of them that are unique to Lab 3, right? So this is the first time you've used the microscopes. You want to make sure that you always use two hands to carry the scope. Don't drag the scopes across the bench. Uh, you always want to pick them up and reposition them. Do not drag them. Use lens paper and only lens paper to clean the lenses before you use them, but after you use them. Keep cords out of the way. Make sure that um, they're not touching back to centimeters. Make sure they're not hanging over the bench. Don't take any of the parts of the scope off, please. And if something does fall off, please let the instructor know. Try very hard not to crack any of your slides or damage the lenses. When you're done using the scope, you've got to turn the power off unplug it, wrap the cord around the base, lower the stage, rotate the nose piece to the 10x objective, clean all of the lenses with lens paper, and then return any slides that were provided by the instructor back to the instructor, discard slides that you prepared in the sharps containers. Okay. And again, I'll remind you of all of these things when we're in class. Some of your observations and interpretations. First thing is, were you able to do the wet mounts? Did you have any problems? Do you understand why a cover slip was necessary for these slides? That's an important thing to note. Were you able to properly identify all of the parts and did you, were you able to use them? Could you actually observe each specimen at each magnification? And then uh, were you able to properly use the, the 100x objective? And were you able to view everything at the 100x objective? So really, honestly, this lab is fully devoted to just teaching you guys how to use the microscopes. It's really all there is to it. And it seems very simple when you just say that, but it's actually quite difficult. Uh, I have, I've had a lot of people struggle in lab three because they think that it's going to be simple and easy and it's actually quite difficult because you're viewing things that are much smaller than what you may have been accustomed to viewing in the past. So some of the things, and, and some of the things that you're probably going to find in the freshwater pond water is they're located here. So these guys are pretty easy to find, usually in your spirogyra. The diatoms, they look like, um, they look like they're made out of glass, which is really strange, but they're very, very interesting looking critters. You're going to see a lot of algae, tons of it, okay? And that's, that's good. Algae is actually a really good place to start. Uh, if you can focus in on a clump of algae, 
usually that's where you're going to find some of these guys. All of these guys over here are your swimmers. They all either have cilia or flagella, and they're going to be swimming around in the water. And usually if you can focus some algae first, then you might be able to find um, some paramecium or euglena or something like that coming up to the algae and, and eating it. So that's a good place to start when you're looking in the pond water. Okay, so thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics. Uh, I've got some in there about focusing scopes and using the oil immersion lens. Um, there's a fun one in there about comparing prokaryotes to eukaryotes, so that's kind of a throwback. Uh, introduction to the protists, right? Protists are eukaryotic bacteria. Have a look at the video description for more videos and leave your questions for me in the comments below. Thank you.